All right, take your Bible, turn to Mark chapter 7. Everybody get notes? Everybody need any notes? We good? Got that covered? All right, glad you came out. And um, it's been cooler the last couple of days, hasn't it? It's been nice. Yeah, you're loving it, ain't you, baby? I bet, I bet, I bet. Uh, we're going to hopefully close out chapter 7 tonight, and uh, then we're going to get back into chapter 8. It's kind of a, a closing section of, of Mark. So uh, this is message number 24. We're going to talk about the idea of be open. Jesus actually says this phrase, be open, to a gentleman. So uh, did you read your text? Anybody get to read the story following along? So we picked up from, from last week, which was actually a couple Wednesdays ago, or maybe a Sunday, a couple Sundays ago when we covered this. Jesus meets a Syrophoenician woman. Remember, he's up in the region of Tyre and Sidon. Her daughter was possessed, uh, which had to be just a horrific situation for her and her daughter, her family, and the whole whole situation. And uh, she, she asked Jesus to come and, and deliver her daughter, to heal her daughter. And remember, Jesus has this interaction with her and says, is it right for me to give the children's bread to the dogs? Remember that? And then what she just asked for? She said, well, I don't want a whole bunch of bread. All I want is what? I just want a little crumb. And then Jesus' response kind of shows us that principle we talked about, the Jew first, that everything goes to the Jew first because that was just God's plan. It's his way of, uh, of sharing the gospel for the world is to go to the Jew first and then to the rest of the world. So uh, Jesus, again, is in the region of, of Tyre and Sidon at this time, and, he, and he's going to leave there uh, tonight. All right, so let's start, start off in verse 31 and read through 37, and let's just see what we got. All right, let's see what the Lord has for us. And it's just amazing when you start studying these stories and kind of focusing in on them, all the stuff that comes out of the, just these little stories. It's just like seven short verses right here. It says, again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he, Jesus, came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Now, by now, you should be kind of hearing some of these familiar terms like the Decapolis and the Sea of Galilee. We've covered some of that already. Then they brought to Jesus one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be open. That's an Aramaic word right there. And that's the translation there. That is, be opened. Immediately his ears were open, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one, but the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. All right, let's see what the Lord has for us this, this evening. So Jesus has, has done many, many things. In fact, sometimes the, the gospel writers just say he went and healed all who were in that village or in that town or in that region, or he healed all that come to him or, or delivered them. So he's done many, many things, many, many miracles in his three and a half years of ministry. In fact, John, going over to John's gospel, he says this about Jesus' ministry, just that short three and a half year period. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Of course, at the end of chapter 20, the chapter previous to that, uh, John said something about, if, if uh, that all these things were written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So what I'm saying is the gospel writers were, were mindful, and obviously the Holy Spirit helped them do this, but they were very mindful to include very specific miracles and healings uh, in Jesus' life because they, they could have just written a ton of stuff. So the, the, the gospels are not necessarily a biography of, of all the day in, day out activities. They are hand-picked stories by the apostles with the help of the Holy Spirit to help us see that Jesus is the only Savior of the world. And then we got these big heavy hidden terms like this. He's the Messiah. He's Christ. He's King. If you were Jew, you would kind of say it that way, Messiah. Uh, kind of the rest of the world would say he's the Christ or the anointed one. It's kind of that Greek word Christos. And then the, the idea is the Messiah, the Christ, is going to be the King. That's kind of the, the focus of our study. This is how Jesus is King. This is why Jesus is King. All right? Now, interesting thing about this this miracle, this healing, is only found in Mark's gospel. It's only found right there. There's, only, there's two stories that are unique to Mark. One's in chapter 8. We'll get to that a little bit later, maybe six or eight, ten more weeks away. You know, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Uh, this, is the, uh, this is unique to Mark. So Mark thought it important 
to include this telling of the story of Jesus and this man who was deaf and mute. All right? So now, go back to our map. I think you've got a map printed out there on your sheet, too. You can follow. He's in the region of Tyre and Sidon when he meets this Phoenician woman, uh, the Syrophoenician woman. So somewhere in this general area is where he is. Now, here's the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jesus spends most of his time kind of circulating around the towns of this, this area of the Galilee. Can you see, Paul? I'm sorry. Um, he's going to go from Tyre and Sidon, this region. He's going to cross over these rivers, probably come down this river a little bit, come down to the Sea of Galilee. Because in this region, it's really important. You walk um, around water. You know, it gets really hot, and there's not that much water around, so you've got to know where to, to navigate. So it's Galilee to Tyre is probably about 40 miles. And uh, going around this region, this area, coming down here, and he's going to come down to the area of the Decapolis, which is this region down in here, all right? Now, when I say those kind of things, just appreciate, Paul, you were talking about that, that joke about the, the boy walking everywhere he, he goes. Um, Jesus walked all this. I mean, they ain't come out with the nice Corvettes yet. They ain't come out with a lot of stuff, you know, and he, he and the disciples walked everywhere. So when we say... They did have Hondas? Yeah. Huh? How do you know? Huh? Uh, here it comes. What'd you get? Oh, I got you. <laughs> I, I, I knew something was coming. Sorry, Miss Pat. <laughs> That's pretty good. I, I'll give you that one. That's right. <laughs> so he walked. You know, think about uh, a day's journeys anywhere from, depending on the terrain and, and all that, um, 15 to 20 miles a day to walk. You know, so you got a couple days journey. You probably got about three or four days journey, all this stuff. You know, Jesus walked thousands and thousands of miles to do what he did. Right? So he's headed to the Decapolis. Now, this is kind of give us some scenario what the Decapolis is. He's been there before. Anybody remember what he did last time he was in this region? When he said he went to the Decapolis, he crossed the Sea of Galilee, went to the other side. Does that ring a bell? And he met the guy who was living among the tombs and, and cast the devil out of the guy that had legion in him, you know, that kind of thing. That's what he meant when he came to the Decapolis the last time. So now he's coming back to the Decapolis. And again, it's that group of ten cities that was founded by Alexander the Great when he came through the land. Now the Romans have pretty much taken all that area over. It's, they're, they're Gentiles mostly. There are probably a few Jews that live in that area, but mostly Gentiles. Um, and they, there's several Roman military bases that they found in this area. Okay, now just think about this. Why would there be 3,000 pigs at this man's farm? That's a big pig farm. Remember that when, when the demons come out and they ran those pigs into this? Why would there be three? That's a lot of pigs. Why would it be? Well, they're feeding at military base. Feeding the military base. Does that make sense now? So, so there's a Roman military base, and the reason they are there is because this is where all the, the zealots live in, in these general areas around the Sea of Galilee. And they're the people that believe Messiah is going to come, and they, they want to raise up a Messiah, or want Messiah to come, a set like that, and deliver them from the Romans. So these are hotbeds for all sorts of things. Nazareth was one of them. Uh, Gamla, which is over in this area, is one of them. So they, they've got these Roman military bases over in here just in case everybody gets a little happy and they can put them down real quick. See what I'm talking about? Now, I tell you all that to say that when Jesus goes into that territory... He's not going into friendly quarters. He's going basically into enemy territory. All right? So when Jesus says things like this to us, love your enemies, he doesn't just tell us to do it. He, he does that. He is doing that when he goes to these Gentiles especially. All right, so it says in verse 32. And, and by the way, we're not doing Facebook tonight. I had to upload it later. We're recording it, but... If you're looking up for it on Facebook, I'll have to do that later, maybe tomorrow. In verse 32, it says, They, they brought him, they, they brought to him, or to Jesus, they brought this man to Jesus, and they begged him. Now, my question to you is, who is they? Who is the they in that passage? It's not a trick question. The people that live there. Some of his friends or something like that, they, they brought him to Jesus. They brought him to Now, this man, is, he's deaf, and, he, and he, can't, he can't speak. He can't communicate other than hands and that kind of thing. So they bring him to Jesus. Now, 
we, we've seen a, one story in particular where some people brought one of their friends to Jesus. What was that all about? Down through the roof, they, they tore the roof off and let him down. So we just see, I just see a real important principle here that it's, it's our labor of love to bring people to Jesus. That's what one of the things we're to be about as Christians is do whatever we can, make every effort possible to see that people are bringing, or to see that people come to Jesus. And maybe they need to come for healing. Maybe they need to come for help and counsel. Maybe, and, and you know, the best place I know to find Jesus in our culture right now, I mean, of course, you can find him anywhere, but it's with another believer, but also in church. So I wouldn't hesitate to translate something. It's important for us to be able to bring people to Jesus, also bring them to church so that they can encounter Jesus, encounter the people of God. Uh, I, I want to go to that kind of place. So we ought to be bringing people in because this is the, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit's here in, among us. Uh, the gifts of the Spirit are supposed to be flowing among us. And we bring people in contact with all of that, and who knows what Jesus will do. So you be a day in somebody's life, will you? You be a day in somebody's life. You help somebody, whatever. Some, some folks are hard-headed. It takes a little while, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. They brought him to Jesus. Now, his condition is pretty laid out right there. But, but think about his, his plight. We're not sure how old he is. I'm, I'm going to assume he's, he's grown. He's deaf. Okay, so he can't hear anything. He's mute. He, he can't speak. Okay, and there's no... There's no aid, really. There's no helps around. There's no hearing aids in that day and age. No, no possibilities. So, so there, there, there are two possibilities. Probably either he was born with this, this problem. It's, it's a strong possibility. We're just not giving the information. Or he lost his hearing at an early age. And the reason I say that is because he's, he's mute. He, he doesn't speak well. If he'd have lost his hearing through an accident at work when he was in his 15, 20-year-old, he would be able to still speak some, you know. But... Some, something happened. Either he was born like this. Now think about his social dilemma. Just think, think in, in that ancient time, how, how, what, what would be the problem with his social interactions with people in his relationship? What, what's the main problem you see? I mean, he can't communicate, you know? So he can't hear you talking. Now maybe he's picking up on some lip reading and things like that if he's older. But he's, he's got quite a, a, a difficult social life or lack thereof. Probably doesn't have one, like you said. Probably did. What, what about his economic situation? It, it had to be limited at best, probably. You know, I'm sure he's doing the best he possibly can, and people are survivors, and they learn to overcome and adapt and things like that. But economically, he'd be limited at best just because he can't communicate. He can't, he can't take orders, receive orders, help customers. He can't do a lot of those kind of things. So he'd probably be, if he had a job, he'd probably be way down on the totem pole. He'd be toting somebody's tool belt or something like that, you know, something of that nature. Now, the religious speculation of some would be that this man has a, a kind of condition that obviously he's not in the favor of God. Remember, John tells us a story in John chapter 9. Remember the, the man that was born blind? What was the question that everybody brought out right there? Who sinned, this man or his parents? Is this some kind of generational thing that got p passed on him? Because obviously he's got some kind of thing. He's not living in what we would understand as the blessing of God. So obviously there's either something horrible in his life or he's paying for somebody else's problem. You know? So this man would fall underneath that same kind of category. And there are some, not all, but there are some, like the Pharisees and things like that, they would look at him and say, uh-oh, something ain't right. So he, he would almost be looked at as... Well, he would certainly be looked at as an outcast just because he, he, can't, he can't participate in the community, you know. But he may also even be looked at as cursed by God, okay. Now, he's going to encounter Jesus. He's going to encounter Jesus. And just kind of pick this encounter apart a little bit. Let's just kind of see what, it, what happens between him and Jesus. It says, and Jesus took him aside from the multitude. You see them, they're coming. Jesus goes into the Decapolis region, and these folks find out he's there, and they come to him. I don't know if it's a crowd of five people, ten people, twenty people, I don't know, but whatever this crowd is here, multitude usually signifies a, a decent number of people, right? Think about this man. Even if he was in our culture today, not just in ancient culture, but in our culture, he, he's been a spectacle all his life. 
You know, people have been whispering, like, yeah, he, he was born that way. He can't, he can't hear you. I'm sorry, honey. You know, that kind of thing. He, he's been a spectacle. People have been wondering about him all his life. And Jesus dignifies him by pulling him aside and gives him his undivided attention. You see? And I want you to notice something. Jesus does this quite often, doing things in secret, doing things that are hidden, that, that he's not ever putting on the show. You ever notice that with Jesus? He never, ever makes a display of what's going on. What is that? What, what do you think? Help me out. To keep the focus on his father? That's good. What else? What do you think? Yeah. So it's, it's like this. Now, Jesus' reputation is a, is a side benefit of it all, but who is Jesus really going to heal these people for? For his father's sake and, and their sake. He's going to do it because he loves God and that he loves people. He's not doing it for himself. He's never doing it. So, so underneath all this is a kind of a hidden lesson, that, and, and we ought to be taking some of these lessons in our church services and stuff like that too, that it's never a show. It's never about us as Christians, as ministers, and maybe God did give you a gift of healing or a particular gift. It, it, it's never to be put on display so that people can see and hear you. That was one of the main problems with the Pharisees, right? They wanted to be seen and heard of people. And I just think about some of the antics that goes on in, in the name of healing, especially nowadays, and people doing all kind of outrageous, silly stuff that, that belongs in the circus more than it does the church. You know what I'm talking about? We can could, we could learn a lot from Jesus. I think he's teaching us humility as well. As our master, he's teaching us that, you know what? Check your pride at the door because we, we oftentimes have a tendency to put on the show. We want people to look at us and admire us. That's kind of one of our, our defaults at times. So Jesus said, to combat this, he just said, come, come over here. We're, we're not going to do all this in front of everybody. This man's been put on display his whole life and everybody's poking fun at him, pointing fingers at him, trying to wonder. And Jesus said, no, no, no more of that. This, this is over. Right? You, you see what I'm talking about? And Jesus really does this because he loves this man. You know? And how, how, you know, that's the power that changes the world right there. That kind of love to where you help somebody, not because it'll look good on your resume or it looks good on your taxes to give generously and all that kind of thing, but you literally begin to do things simply with the motivation of love. That kind of power changes the world. That's what Jesus is doing. So this man encounters Jesus. And notice what Jesus does right here. He puts his fingers in his ears. Okay. He spat. I don't know. This is the story where Jesus spits on somebody. It looks like. I don't, I don't, I don't have a whole lot of explanation for that. Either he spat on the ground. He spit on the Is it spit or spat? Spit or spat or spit? It's spit. <laughs> It's spit, it's spit here or spat there, right? Okay. <laughs> it depends on what you do. I don't think I heard anybody say, he spat on me. I, I, I think they say spit, right? He, he, he spits somehow, whether it's on the ground or on his fingers, and he touches this man's tongue almost in an examination-type fashion is what I see. He looks up to heaven, he sighed, and then he spoke. Be opened. What is, what's he doing? You ever notice all the different ways Jesus heals people and does stuff? Sometimes he'll just send the word. Just like that, the lady, the last story. He just, he just sent the word and said, your daughter's, your daughter's healed. Okay. Some other time, he, he'll go into the room with the girl. He'll lay hands on her and raise her up from the dead. He'll, it's hardly any time he does things the same. I wonder why he does that. Why does he mix the waters so much? I think he's communicating something else to us that, hey, there, there is no healing methods. There is the healer. That's who I am. That's all there is. There's no, there's no you, you do this and jump on your, your right leg three times, spin around and, and cluck like a chicken, you're healed. See, that's some kind of hocus pocus. That's, see, that's, that's that stuff we talked about Sunday, the incantations and all the stuff the, the pagans do. There's no formula to it. Jesus doesn't do, the, do things over and over. And, the, and you look at the apostles. They picked up on that because when they get to the book of Acts, they don't do things... Similar. Even as Jesus did it, they, they do it differently. It's got to be led by the Spirit and all this stuff. So what's Jesus doing? Fingers in the ears. T 
touching his tongue, looking up to heaven. Well, look, look at it through the eyes of the man. Okay, now we, 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 we read it as, the, as a reader, looking at it. Now look at this story as him. You're him now. He, he can't hear verbal commands, right? He can't tell you what's wrong. So what's, Jesus is communicating in a way that this man can understand. This is beautiful, actually. Do you see that? He, he's, I, I mean, I, I, I see it. I'm, I'm, we'll expand on some of this in a minute. Jesus touches his ears. Obviously, somebody's communicated what's going on with him. He touches this man's ears. Nobody's ever done that before, I about to guarantee you other than maybe a medical doctor or something. He, he, he puts his fingers in his ears and he touches his tongue. You see what's going on? He's like this. Can, can, you, can, can you talk? Can you talk? And then, then he, he, he looks up to heaven. He's like, Jesus looks up to heaven. Maybe as he's touched that. And that, that man, can you see that man going? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Making his noises. You see what I'm talking about? It's beautiful what Jesus is doing. He, he's meeting this man right where he is. He, he's, he's speaking in sign language. That's what he's doing. You know, and you see Jesus' tenderness just reaching out to this man. And when I read it, just studying it this afternoon, it just hit me how tender he is with this guy. Now, outside of his mama, maybe nobody's been this tender to this man in a long time. And Jesus just meets him right there. All right? So he puts his fingers in his ears. And he spat, and he touched his tongue, okay? He touched him in the place where he needed it the most. You see that? That's just Jesus, isn't it? He touches you right where, and, and, you know, other people, even some of the, the healers and people that pray for him, they wouldn't touch his ears because they, there would be a lot of superstition. So if I could touch those, maybe I would catch whatever problem he has, I'd catch it. So nobody would do that kind of thing. Now, th this is the kind of idea of the, the spitting. There's ancient Jewish and Gentile stories about the spit of healers that can heal people. There's, there's actual historical records of those kind of, um, uh, what, what would you say, um, actions and happenings, that, that the spit of healers. And, and spit has uh, healing qualities. I mean, why, why does a dog, our dog right now, he's dealing with all kind of allergies. You know what he does? What does he do? He licks. Why? He knows something about that. And, it, and, if, and if I come in and I got a skint knee, guess what he's going to do? And, it, it's, it's some, and now you can pick up some bacteria. We know about that kind of stuff nowadays too, right? Um, but here's something else about spit. My mama knew this about spit. It's got cleaning properties. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can't even tell you. I, I have been spit bathed before. You get, you get some ketchup on your face. And, and Mama wouldn't even get a napkin. I don't know how y'all's mama did it. She'd, she'd get that off your face right there. Didn't care. Anybody, anybody know about that? Lord, that's just nasty. Ain't it? <laughs> anyway, anyway. I, I believe through all of this, Jesus is saying, I'm your healer. I, I'm your healer. I'm going to heal your ears. I'm going to heal your tongue and the spitting thing. It's just real, I'm not sure about the spitting thing, okay? Now, the other story that's in Mark alone is, is, is another spitting story. You know, it's another time Jesus makes some spittle with some mud pies and all that kind of stuff, okay? We'll get into some of that. So, so he, he, he's just communicating to this man, I'm here to heal you. I'm going to heal you. Now, what's happening to this man right now? When, when Jesus puts his fingers in his ears and touches his tongue, what's happening to this man? He's coming alive now, isn't he? He's come, he's, what's happening to his faith, do you think? Man, he ain't had this kind of hope ever that he's going to get. I mean, I'm sure he's been to doctors. They had doctors back then. I'm sure he's been to see people, and he's probably been to the synagogue. People prayed for him, asked God to touch him, help him. But nobody's had this kind of compassion on him, and nobody's given him this kind of hope. So he, he's got a chance right here. Now, Jesus looks up to heaven. I'm just picking all this apart now. Just reading it slow, thinking through it. That's all I did. I just go in these phrases and look at it, and then I think. I think and then I write. And then I think and then I write. Sometimes I go get a commentary and I read, okay, just so you know. Looking up to heaven, 
what, what's, what's it associated with when we lift up our eyes to heaven? What's that associated with? That we're, we're, we're looking to God. I mean, Psalm 121, lift up your eyes to the hills, for my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, Psalm 121. So it's, it's, it's kind of a picture. Jesus, again, is acting it out. So this man, he can see now. He can see, right? He just can't hear and talk. So he's looking up to heaven, and I can, I can see this man. I, I can see him. God's going to heal me. And Jesus is communicating to him, God is going to heal you through me. That's what he's communicating to him. And yeah, how would he hear? How would he even know? You know, there's just something attractive about Jesus with him. And, and you know, nobody's probably ever had the boldness to, to do all this. So there's something unique happening here. The message from Jesus looking up to heaven is, he, Jesus is saying to this man, I am the one that connects you to God. He says the same thing to us, doesn't he? I'm the one that connects you. I'm the one who brings heaven and earth together. I'm, I'm the one that brings it all together. To happen. In fact, I'm bringing the kingdom of God to you right now. And I'm the one who brings the blessings of heaven to you. Okay? Yes, sir. And not know something about him, something divine about him. So even his enemies knew that, didn't they? Whether they had faith or not, they knew something, something was special about him. Right? So he, he just looks up to heaven. It's interesting. I I can guarantee you when Jesus lifts his eyes to heaven, where does that man's eyes go? Going in the same direction. Going to heaven too. And it says Jesus sighed. He sighed. I mean, Jesus is fully engaged with this man. Fingers in the ears. He's he's face to face with this man, okay? It'd be quite a sight to see this, really. And Jesus just takes a... Just a big, a big deep breath, and he sighs. What, what in the world? Now, we think about the man feeling the power of Jesus. Think about Jesus feeling the pain of the man. Jesus is feeling the pain of this person. That's an important connection point. They, they, they are fully engaged with each other. They are fully connected at this point. The Spirit has done something between them to bond them. He's going to feel the power of Jesus, but Jesus, it, it, it doesn't have to do this. I mean, Jesus is about to heal this man. He knows he's going to heal it. Why would he stop right here and feel the sorrow and the grief? Why would he feel that? Well, that's who he is, isn't it? That, that's, that's, where, that's where love is. Even when you know you're going to do something good for somebody, but when you know they're in a bad spot, it still grips your heart, doesn't it? Still grips your heart. So it, it kind of brought to mind Isaiah 53, 4 right here. Speaking of Jesus, back from the prophet Isaiah, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. In those moments, Jesus felt this man's dysfunction in society. He felt his pain. He felt all of his frustration. He felt his hopes and dreams that had been shattered. He, he can't do what normal people would do, so to speak. He, he felt that. And Jesus just, he felt it. Mm-hmm. So he, he, he's, he's got a way. And, and I don't, it's, it's a spiritual connection. It's not feeling like, like this right here. It's, it's something deep in the heart of Jesus that touched deep in the, the, the matrix of this, the center of the inner man of this, this man. And Jesus feels it. And that's, that's important for us. Hebrews 4.15, you you know this passage. The first part of it says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. The old King James, I like the way the old King James says it right here, who is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. You see what I'm talking about? So it's it's not about just about this man receiving power. There's something redemptive happening that this man knows that Jesus feels his pain. There, there's something that connects us. There's something that, that makes Jesus our great high priest. That he can literally sympathize and he, he oftentimes empathizes with our, with our pain. He, he's, he's been there before. He's resisted temptation. He knows what that's about. Okay? 
So Jesus is, is going to have compassion, and this is one of the sources of his compassion, is that he, he can feel what you're going through. Now you think about that, because one of the ways the enemy gets us distracted, and he gets us off by ourselves, and he gets us pulling away, is he says this, he, he puts these thoughts in our head that nobody understands me. Nobody cares about me. Well, there, here's a somebody right here that does. That he can literally feel the grief and the sorrow. See, go back, go back to that, that grief and sorrow. See, why does a person grieve? They grieve because they lost something or someone, right? They've lost something. Why do they have sorrow? Well, that's just the outward working of all the side effects of all that loss. So this man has lost a lot. He, he's, he's lost a lot. He's, he's got a lot of what he would maybe consider wasted years. What, if, you know, what am I even here for? And now, now he has an encounter with Jesus, and Jesus feels all that. And there's something about Jesus validating our pain that is part of our healing. Yeah, you have lost. We, we can learn a lot from him in this kind of thing. Just take time. Not just get to the power, but sometimes we've got to feel the pain when we minister, all right? Now, I see all of this pointing to the cross. It's just pointing straight to the cross because the cross is the point where Jesus really takes it all on, okay? The cross is the place where he heals us at the greatest point of all of our need. The cross is the place where he identifies with us as sinners, as people that are far from God and are at a great loss that we can't make up the difference, Right? The cross is the place where he touches us in our most shameful and broken place. This man's broken. He can't even plug in. He can't even be what, a, a real human. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he's valuable. Obviously, Jesus points that out. But he, he can't function and participate and, and be productive like he wants to be. Like what's in his heart, probably. You know? And Jesus touches him right there in that shameful broken place where nobody else can get to. The cross is a place where he takes on our sin, he takes on our sickness, and he takes on our, I like to write it like this, our dis-ease or disease. He takes that all on himself. So all this is pointing to the cross because it's at the cross is the place where he begins to heal us and restore us, right? And it's at the cross where he opens up our ears and looses our tongue to praise God. That's the place where it happens. Okay. And then Jesus says this word. Be opened. Be opened. Again, we, we pointed out this several times. This happened several times already in Mark's writings. Jesus doesn't call on a higher power. Or he doesn't invoke the name of God. He doesn't, he doesn't do what we would maybe even think pray. Why? Why does he not call on a higher power? He is. He is. Same answer we've had in times past. He is that higher power. So he, he doesn't just... See, if I prayed for you, I would say, be, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Or I would, I would say, Jesus, we ask you... To, I, would, I would invoke or ask him to heal. Why does Jesus not ask anybody to heal? Well, because he's the healer. <laughs> he, he doesn't appeal to the healer. He is the healer. That's what Mark's getting at. He is the healer. He just speaks. Be opened. And two miracles happen immediately. Because everything has to respond to his word one way or another. Everything responds to his word. Be open. And immediately two miracles happen. His ears were open and he could hear. And you could almost even say three, three miracles happened. His tongue was loosed and he could speak plainly. And now think about that. He couldn't speak at all. He couldn't hear at all. How would he know language? How would he know his vowels and consonants? It's, it's a miracle. Jesus just restores all of that in one fell swoop. He restores his hearing, which is the source of the problem. He restores his speech, and he gives him language all at one time. Boom. Just right there. Mm -hmm. Oh, happy day. <laughs> How do you think he's feeling now? Mm -hmm. he, he's, it's quite a day. 
I bet they couldn't shut them up for about two weeks. What do you think? <laughs> and they wouldn't want to, you know, that kind of thing. Now Jesus says something very curious to us. And I want you to talk it out with me a little bit. He said, now, I gave you the gift of speech. I gave it back to you. Now don't go tell anybody. <laughs> and he tells the crowd, keep this to yourself. Don't tell anybody. We've heard him say that before, haven't we? What in the world? Now that's not going to be possible and they don't stick to it either. They go and they proclaim it out there. Why don't tell anybody? Why would Jesus say that to somebody like that? Why would he raise a little girl from the dead and say, hey, y'all just keep that in here. Just keep it to yourself. <laughs> Why would he do that, at least for the time being? Any, any thoughts? Mm-hmm. Anybody else? Why would he do that? Where is he? He's in the Decapolis, right? Who's sitting up on that hill up there? Them Romans. Now, Jesus is not afraid of anybody. But he does have a plan and a purpose for everything he's doing. And he knows what he's working toward. He knows he's working towards the cross. He knows he's working to go back to Jerusalem. And, you know, these, the, the ideas that are floating around coming out of Jesus' mouth, uh, what, what happened to John the Baptist recently? Saying the same kind of stuff. So these, these ideas that Jesus, in, in this, this kind of cauldron that he's in, this, this, this pot, uh, this, this soup is bad, it's hot. The Romans, the Jewish leaders, they're not liking him. I mean, they've already got a plan. They've already made some alliances. We've got to get rid of this man. And I, I just think Jesus is saying, I don't want you to tell him, but just hold this right here. I've got some things I need to do. I've got some covering I need to get taken care of. I've got to go. Because you remember the route, we, we showed you the map, he takes this long route and goes right down here like this right here. He avoided his hometown. He avoided all that region for the time being. Why? Well, we saw in chapter 7, it got pretty hot around there, didn't it? Things are pressing in on Jesus, and he knows it. And he knows he's got to get to the cross, so he says, just, just for my sake and wisdom's sake, why don't y'all just hold this down and let me get out of town? That's Three years, he said, don't tell anybody. And then at the end, he said, tell everybody. Exactly. That's a great point. That's my next point. So, so for these years, he says, don't tell anybody. I'm working something out. I'm working with my family here. This is all family business I'm dealing with. And then he comes to the Mount of Ascension. He says, now go tell everybody. Go, tell them, go teach them and tell them everything I did and said to you. You know what I'm talking about? Because it's, it's all part of the plan. So. But it's, it's kind of curious because think about that happening at your house. Well, your brother or, or, or your sister or your loved one, you couldn't keep a lid on that, could you? <laughs> It'd be tough. They couldn't either. Now, here's, here's, here's the commentary on it all. This is the fallout or, or the, the word on the street, I should say. And they were astonished beyond measure. I bet they were. Saying this about Jesus. He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Hmm. Now, remember we started off about telling you about the apostles picking certain stories in the life of Jesus to get, get something across? This is why Mark picks this story. This phrase right here, the deaf to hear and the mute to speak, is, is a hearkening back to something. Okay? Mark is telling us, remember, these, these are stories not for just great information or not for just feel-good times. These, this is information for us to have faith in who Jesus really is. That's what this is about. That's what the teaching ministry is about. It's not about you getting more information about what the Decapolis is and all that. That's all wonderful things. But the point is, is your faith's got to get strength. You've you, you got to grow in your faith about who Jesus is. And that's why Mark puts this story right here. This, this phrase, these phrases here are found in Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6. Okay? And Mark is just hoping that you're a good student of your Bible to know what this is all about. And there's actually another Greek word that is only found in Isaiah 35 as well in this story in the Septuagint version. Okay? Now, set it up. Isaiah 34. It shows the judgment of God over the whole earth. It talks about how the land's going to be desolate, no water, just owls and ravens and porcupines and all that just covering the land. No, no good things happening there. Isaiah 34 talks about the judgment on creation on all the world. 
okay, on the nations especially. Then Isaiah 35 talks about what God's going to do to rescue his world, okay? Now, I want, I want to read that to you. Start in verse number, what did I say, verse number four? This is what Mark is pointing to. He's hoping you'll go pull out your other Isaiah scroll and go, oh, I heard that before. That's in Isaiah. Let's go read what that is because it's going to show us a picture of who Jesus is now. Say to those, can you read that? You see it all right? Say to those, this is Isaiah 35, who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance with the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Are you making it? So if this is referring to Isaiah 35, it is referring to Jesus being the one who will come and save you. Okay? There's, there's more. We're going to keep reading. Now here's an interesting thing about this. Your God will come with vengeance. Now Jesus doesn't come... With vengeance, he literally comes to take the vengeance on himself. He doesn't come just to pronounce judgment on people. That's not his way he says that. I didn't come to condemn the world. The world's already condemned, actually. I didn't come to condemn. I came to save the world. That's what Jesus came to do, right? And how is he going to save the world? Well, he's not bringing the judgment of God on people. What he's wanting to do is to take the judgment of God upon himself so that people that follow him can now partake in his reward. Hmm. Let's read some more of this. I think it'll, it'll make sense. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. So when God comes to save you, these are the things that's going to happen. The eyes of the blind shall be opened. Okay, we we see him doing that, right? And the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. We just saw that story, right? Then the lame shall leap like a deer. I think we saw a story like that, or we've read one in the Gospels about that. We got to the temple at the gate. Remember that? It's happening, okay? Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. So we got our phrases right there. The ears of the deaf and the tongue of the dumb, or the mute, shall sing. All right? For water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Okay? I think John the Baptist said something about that, didn't he? Something very similar to that. Okay? The parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of jackals where each lay there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. Okay? That's, that's good stuff, by the way. That's that's ancient poetry. That's like a good place to live. That's what that means, right? A highway shall be there and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing with everlasting joy on their heads. Anybody remember that old song we sing, of course? Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. And everlasting joy shall be upon their head. I guess they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Nobody singing with me. Nobody knows that, huh? <laughs> That's all right. That's, it's, it's just an old, it's an old 80 or 90s course. <laughs> so, anyway, it's just a scripture song. It's this, this thing right here. With everlasting joy in their head, they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. What's all that mean? Jesus is the one that's going to make all this happen. He is the one that's going to bring new creation to the earth that's been messed up and to the people that's been messed up. That's why this story's in there. That's why Mark put that in there. Because that, that idea about the deaf and the mute, the deaf hearing and the mute speaking, that idea is to connect you and say, Jesus is the rightful king of the world and he is God coming to do all of this. 
See what I'm talking about? Does that make sense to you? That's what Mark wants you to see. This is who Jesus really is. Okay? Questions, comments before we go? You got it? Shake your head like this. Or like this. Or like this. <laughs> just, just, just. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's that's how the church is actually built, you know, through time and, and history. Is that somebody gets the bread and they go tell somebody else where they got it from? You know, that kind of thing. All right, we're good. All right, let's ask the Lord to help us with, with our faith. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for this story. We thank you for your compassion with this man. Um, he'd been overlooked for many years, kind of pushed to the corner and pushed aside, but you came, you dignified him, Lord, and you brought healing into his life. Lord, we, we can relate to that. We thank you for that. We thank you for his story. We thank you for what you've done. And Lord, may we, may we see you as our answer, as our Savior, as the one who rescues us out of all the darkness that we get ourselves in. You're the one that heals all the broken places, whether they be physical or spiritual in nature, or even relational in nature, Lord, whatever that may be, it's broken in our place. You are the one that goes and communicates to us right where we are, touches us right where we are, and even touches that most shameful place, Lord, where we won't let anybody get in there. You help us and you heal us. And Lord, because you help us and heal us, we're also going to trust all of creation with you. We're going to believe that you're going to bring new creation just like you said. You're going to remove the curse off of this planet. You're going to remove the curse off of your people. Lord, you're going to do away with death. You're going to do away with sorrow. You're going to do away with pain. All that stuff, Lord, you're going to do away with it. Help us, Lord. Strengthen our faith in who you are. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. and Give us tongues to speak your praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.